Good morning, church family. So I think I know most of you, but in case there's someone new, I, like Tim, want to say welcome to you, and it be a special welcome. For those of you who are newer, or it might be your first time here, my name is Bonnie, and I am the Minister of Discipleship here at Troy UMC. And it is a pleasure for me to be here with you this morning, and I'm just thankful that each of you, newer, first time, or been here forever, are here and spending your Sunday morning together. So I don't know about you, but when I woke woke up this morning, I was excited. I got to church, and I was one of the first people here. All the lights were turned off except for the Christmas lights, and my heart jumped up and down with glee. It's that time of year. Thanksgiving is over, and we have entered into the Advent season. We have Christmas trees and wreaths and candles inside. Outside, the air is brisk, and the streets are lined with Christmas decorations. You also can see that behind us, we have the nativity set. And you might be asking yourself, where are all the people? Well, today we are diving into a new sermon series entitled The Nativity. This five-week series is an adventure to Bethlehem. Now, normally in the Nativity, we see Joseph and Mary kneeling by the manger, surrounded by animals. Shepherds stand by and look with awestruck wonder. The Magi are approaching with expensive gifts from afar. There are angels and a star, and of course, there is the Christ child himself. But this Advent, we are going to highlight a different person from the nativity scene each week. And slowly, the nativity behind me will come to life and become complete. But before we get into the message, I'd love for us to go to God in prayer. Let's take a moment and center our hearts and pray together. Holy Lord, in this time of Advent, we confess we often are distracted by the season's busyness, by the stress of commitment, and even by putting our own traditions ahead of the true meaning of Christmas. We confess we also often prefer being sentimental to being focused on the sacred. Forgive us for all the times we have missed seeing you in our midst, for all the times we have doubted your presence, and for all the times we have failed to hold up the holidays as holy days. Pour peace into our lives and let us be bearers of your peace to others. Remind us that this is a season of waiting and preparation for the greatest gift of all. In the holy name of our Savior Jesus, we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. Open our hearts and our minds and our souls to your presence among us. Amen. So, I want to talk nativities this morning. I did a little bit of research, and it seems that the earliest nativity scene was found in a Christian catacomb of St. Valentine and traces back to 380 AD. Then, roughly 850 years later, St. Francis of Assisi is credited with creating the first live nativity scene in 1223 in central Italy. His nativity was said to be an attempt to place the emphasis on Christmas upon the worship of Christ rather than upon material things. Hmm, some things don't change. Staged in a cave, St. Francis's nativity scene was a living one with humans and animals cast in the biblical roles. Distinctive nativity scenes and traditions have been created around the world and are displayed during the Christmas season in churches, homes, shopping malls, and all other kinds of venues. Nativity scenes also haven't escaped controversy. As many of us know in the United States, they've been placed in public land and in public buildings and have provoked court challenges. By show of hand this morning, how many of you have a nativity in your home? Pretty much all of us. 
The video that we saw showcased how nativity sets are something most of us have now or we had when we were growing up. We spent time finding one that was exactly what we wanted. We have special ones that remind us of family or a place that we traveled around the world. We look at them on our shelves, and whether they are large or small, ornate or simplistic, these characters hold so much meaning and so much weight. Now, many of you know that I am one of those people when it comes to Christmas. I've shared this with you before. My family does all the things, and Micah and I do all the things. We build gingerbread houses and decorate sugar cookies. We light the advent candle at our dining room table. We sing all the songs, and we go see all the lights. We watch every single Hallmark movie. Now, I may not have 450 nativity sets like my Old Testament professor. Yes, literally 450. But our living room shelves are lined with nativity sets that connect us with places that we've been, churches and congregations from the past, and family who have passed on. And here's the thing. Eventually, our Christmas tree comes down and is put away until next year. The wreath on the front door is replaced, and our focus shifts to the new year. But in our household, the nativity remains. There's just something about it. It transcends the Advent season and becomes a part of our lives all year long. We've placed these characters in a manger and we've placed them on a pedestal. They seem unreachable, we look at them with awestruck wonder, just as the shepherds looked at Jesus on that first Christmas. We see perfection in these characters. We forget they are human, and we can't imagine that they are anything like us. Today, we are going to take a deeper look at Joseph, and we are going to lovingly take him off that pedestal, set him on solid ground in front of us, at look and look at him with fresh eyes. The scripture reading for today is from the book of Matthew, the first chapter. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, which is the second half of the Bible. Matthew is one of the four gospels, which basically means it talks about the life and ministry of Jesus. And in verses 18 through 19, we read, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So in the culture of the day, the fact that Mary and Joseph were pledged to be married meant they were legally bound to one another and could only be separated by divorce. In the situation of adultery, which is what seemed to be the case here, Mary would have likely been stoned to death. Being faithful to the law meant that Joseph knew the Torah and he kept it. He was obedient to God's law first and foremost. However, Above and beyond that, we see that Joseph was a man who was willing to balance faithfulness to the law and the attribute of mercy. Joseph showed Mary mercy in this moment by choosing not to expose her to public disgrace and planned to divorce her quietly so that she could literally keep her life. As we continue on, we read in verse 20, but after he had considered this, now we're going to press pause and look at those six simple words because they are powerful. But after he had considered this, these words show us the reality that God allowed time for Joseph to make his own choice before stepping in. Joseph had to first wrestle with the reality that he was given. And he came up with the best option that he could according to the law. Only then did God step in. It's interesting to think about how often we wait to hear from God. We sit and we ask, God, why aren't you speaking? Why aren't you doing anything? But the truth is, 
he's already spoken. The Bible, God's law, guided Joseph, and it can still guide us today. The passage continues and states, An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is when I close my book and the story is over, right? I mean, it's Bonnie's shortest sermon ever. <laughs> there was a problem, God solved the problem, and then they all lived happily ever after, right? It's the end. I mean, that seems to be often how we take this text, isn't it? We read it as if it's a fairy tale or a Hallmark Christmas movie. There's a slight issue, the issue gets solved, the couple kisses, and then the credits roll. But here's the thing. When we read the passage in that way, we subconsciously place Mary and Joseph in a bubble. Take a second and think of all the thoughts that would have flooded Joseph's mind in the moment when he found out that Mary was pregnant. Who's the father? What will my parents think? What will my rabbi think? Her parents are never going to believe that I'm not the father. What if this gets out? Who already knows? What if somebody that I work with finds out? I wonder what they think about me. The reality is there is no bubble in this culture. Family is everything. They would have both lived with family and been surrounded by family all the time. Joseph's decisions would have affected not only Mary and him, but also every member of both of their families. If his reputation was tarnished, the whole family's reputation was tarnished. So when Joseph woke up from the dream, his reality, those questions and those concerns, they didn't just disappear. He made a conscious choice. He changed from saying, okay, God, I'm going to follow your law and show mercy to Mary, to standing up and saying, okay, God, I'm going to follow you and risk everything. And the thing is, I don't think he would have been able to make the second statement without first making the initial statement. Joseph shows us that at first you might know how to follow the law, but eventually you have to make the choice to also follow the Lord. Now let's fast forward 30 years into the life and ministry of Jesus. I'd like to highlight two stories in light of what we now know about Joseph. First, we turn to John chapter 8, and we find Jesus at the Mount of Olives. The passage reads, At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in an act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis of accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this time, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left. And he stood up and he asked, Woman, 
Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. You have to wonder to yourself if there was a glimmer in Jesus' eye as he spoke this words to the woman. You have to wonder if there was a point when he was a teenager that his dad set him down and told him the story of his birth and the days that led to the manger. Did he, do, did he hear what his mother had gone through? Did his dad share with him the decisions he was faced with? Did his father look him straight in the eye and tell him, now Jesus, remember this, you hold the law in one hand and mercy in the other, and neither should outweigh the other. You have to wonder, did Jesus see the people he ministered to through the lenses of his father's testimony in his own life? Let's hold on to those wanderings and turn to one last story found in the 19th chapter of Matthew. Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. When we look at this passage, it's hard to not compare Joseph and the rich young man. Both young men followed the law and were obedient to it. But there are two distinct differences between them. First, when Joseph was asked to risk his comfortable life, he made the choice to do so, while the rich young man chose comfort over risk. And second, Joseph followed. The rich young man turned away. From these two passages highlighting moments in the ministry of Jesus, I believe we get a glimpse at how Joseph's decision to risk his reputation shaped not only his own life, but also the life and ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which in turn shapes our lives. In the same way, our willingness to risk our reputation, our finances, or whatever else is asked of us for the sake of Christ will not only change our lives, but can change the lives of others for generations to come. But first, we have to ask the same question that Joseph asked himself. Is following God worth the risk? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you today, this first day of Advent, and we thank you for your humanly follow father Joseph and the life that he led. We thank you for how we can learn and grow because of his life. And Lord, I cry out to you for each heart in this room that that question would linger. Is following God worth the risk? Some of us might jump up from our chairs right now and say, yes, it is. Some of us may not be sure. But I ask that that question linger with each of us. Help us, Lord, to wrestle with who we are and whose we are. And help us, Lord, to decide to take the risk. Amen.